Good afternoon. My name is Detective Encinas, and I am a full-time recruiter with the Mesa Police Department. Um, welcome. We are putting on a seminar for all of you potential applicants, applicants who are already might be in the process, and any future applicants who are looking to maybe make a cha career change, uh, move into the field of law enforcement, and just might have a few questions about how to get the process started. So uh, myself, my boss, Sergeant Jenkins, and the hiring uh, sergeant, Sergeant Robbie Jones, uh, are the three people who have put this seminar on. Um, due to uh, some other issues related to Corona, it's just gonna be me today, so, um, but at the end, I will give you some contact information for my two bosses as well, if you would like to get a hold of them. Our department developed uh, uh, last year sometime, a seminar to help people along in the process. So we came up with some ideas on how to help you navigate the process and hopefully become uh, one of those successful applicants that receives a job offer from Mesa PD. I'm gonna go over the hiring process itself. So we're gonna give you an overview of that from start to finish. Um, we also are gonna cover our new um, application process, we've gone strictly to an electronic application. So we're gonna cover that because if you've applied for our department before, or if you were in the process of applying at maybe another agency within Arizona or in another state, they may, may not have this program. So uh, what this does is it eliminates all the paper and you will turn everything in electronically. The next thing we'll cover is how to be successful in the hiring process. So that is probably one of the main things that most people ask us on a daily basis is, you know, what can I do to get ahead? How can I uh, study for the exam? What should I be doing physical fitness wise? All of that, all of those questions come into us at a daily basis. So we'll kind of cover that as well. And um, so hopefully answer a lot of those questions for you. And the last thing we'll cover is academy preparation, both mentally and physically. So we'll cover some of those things uh, for those of you who are farther along in the process or who are having some questions about whether you can make it through an academy, you cannot, we'll give you some tips and strategies on how to be successful if you make it to that step. Mesa, Arizona, we are the 35th largest city in the nation. We're the third largest city in Arizona. So we have Phoenix, of course, which is by far the largest city. Uh, we have Tucson, which is about two hours south of here. And then Mesa, we are the third largest city in Arizona. Our population last year was measured right around half a million people. As far as the police department itself is concerned, uh, we are in the process of updating our numbers, but we have approximately 780 sworn police officers that work for our department. In addition to that, we have about 450 civilian uh, personnel that work for us in a bunch of different capacities. Within the city, we have four patrol districts. So when you make it out of the academy and you get assigned to the field training program, and then later on get out on the street on your own, you will be assigned to one of our four, four patrol districts. There's the Fiesta District, which is our southwest part of the city. Central District, which is the middle part of the city in the downtown area. There's the Red Mountain District, which is a little bit east of uh, downtown and then the Superstition District, which basically covers most of the east side of the city. So a few things that we have that our department has that maybe you're curious about or maybe you might have a question about. So we offer, our, we have our own police academy, okay? So when you get hired by the city of Mesa, we offer you a position, you don't have, we don't send you to another town, another city, or another police department's academy. We have our own in-house training academy, and that's located um, at 3260 North 40th Street in Mesa. It's out in east, Northeast Mesa. Um, it's a 45-acre facility. We also have a driving track out there as well. That is where you will do all of your uh, training in the academy as far as uh, driving patrol vehicles, and how to, how to uh, do certain maneuvers, things like that. We, they will cover all of that out at the driving track. We have 11 classrooms out there. And in addition, we also have a pretty large auditorium, which is where we do a lot of our larger trainings. 
It is where uh, most of you will be taking your written exam. It'll be in the auditorium. So we have that, and then that's what we use for big events and other agency trainings, things like that. We also have our own firearms range that is located not at the academy, but at a, at a different location within the city. It's a 16-acre facility. We have um, 25 automatic stations there where we qualify. Um, in addition to that, we have a few other ranges that are on the property as well. We have a live firehouse where we practice doing entries into buildings, things like that. Uh, we also have a rifle range there. I believe it goes out to 200 meters. And we also have our on-site armory. We have full-time staff that work out at the range and they handle everything related to your duty weapons, ammo, things like that, in addition to all the training that put on by the department. Let's talk about uh, a little bit about benefits um, as a police officer recruit. So as you can see by the slide, um, our starting pay in the academy is currently $56,534 a year. That is what you make while you're in the academy. So when you start at the academy, that is your base salary. We get paid every two weeks in, the, in, in our department. In addition to your salary, you're also gonna get your full benefits right away. We will have a, a week prior to the start of the academy where we bring you in, we get you your benefits assigned, we get you make sure you have your medical stuff, your dental, your vision plans, and that way when you hit the academy, you don't have to worry about that stuff. We are ready to go. We have the public safety retirement system. And if you would like to look that up, when you get a chance, you can Google that. And that'll go through the, um, that'll give you what the two choices are for pensions and retirement system within the state of Arizona. And then you have a, the ability to choose between one or one or the other plan. We will give you a class on that later on down the road. It's not something anybody needs to worry about right now when you're getting the process started, but it is available if you would like to look it up. The city of Mesa provides about 8,000, just a little bit over $8,000 a year for tuition reimbursement. Uh, the only caveats are being you have to be off of probation. So for any new police officers, you're looking at 18 months before you're off probation. Once you do that though, you can uh, advance your education if you choose, go back and get your four-year degree or your master's degree, and the city will cover $8,000 of that a year as long as you pass with a grade of C or above. Uh, we also offer annual uniform allowance. That is $1,200 a year, and that normally comes every July. As a new officer, you will get that about six to eight weeks into the academy. They will give you a check for $1,200 to, to defer some of the cost of uniforms and gear and things like that. You're trying to figure out the odds of you getting hired. Well, with Mesa PD, we hire about five to 7% of all the applicants who put in for the job. Don't let that discourage you though. We are, this is 2020. We're gonna hire over hundred officers this year. We are on pace to do the same thing next year as well. And we're gonna continue that as far as I know into the future. What do we need to apply? Well, you have to meet minimum requirements. So the minimum requirements that we're talking about are things that you cannot, that you have to either meet or you cannot have violated in, in any certain way. These are requirements that are put on by the state. They're not Mesa PD requirements. These are state requirements. And if you wanna look those up, at, on the top of the slide there, you can see the website you can go to. It's azpost.gov slash minimum requirements. And you can look there and make sure that that is something that you're even eligible for. Many, many questions that we get into our office in the recruiting unit and in the hiring unit relate to these minimum requirements. So I'll do my best to kind of skim through these, but like I said, you can go online and really look at those yourself to make sure you, you meet all these that are necessary. So you have to be, the first one is you have to be 21 years old by the time you graduate from the academy. So you can apply when you're 20, 20 and a half, somewhere in there. The academy is currently 22 weeks long. We normally recommend most people on the young, younger end of that at 20 years old, start applying right about 22 months, 
20 in two months or 20 and a half, somewhere in there. You, have, you also have to have a high school diploma or a GED, not both, one or the other. If you have anything above and beyond that, that's great. That is not a minimum requirement. If you have college, things like that, that'll come into play later on down the line when you are looking to maybe move to a specialty unit or to get promoted. You cannot have any felony convictions. This is another one that we get constantly, um, we get questions about. And not only can you not have any felony convictions, but if you were charged with a crime that is a felony in the state of Arizona, and it maybe got pled down to a misdemeanor in whatever city, town, state you live in, we will still consider that a felony and more than likely uh, you will not meet minimum requirements for that. The next one is no dishonorable military discharge. Uh, I have not been in the military before, but I am familiar with some of the types of discharges that are coming out now that we see. Uh, there's other than honorable, there's other, there's things like that. You cannot have a dishonorable military discharge. If you do, that's an automatic disqualifier. If you have something that you're concerned about and you think it might fall into that category, we can answer those questions on an individual basis, but it cannot be dishonorable. The next one is you have to have a Class D license by the your hire date. All that means is the state of Arizona, a Class D license is our norm, normal operator's license. That's something almost all of us get unless you have a commercial license. All you have to do is you have to have one by the time you start in the academy. So I know we have people that move here from out of state. They come, they go straight to the academy. You got to make some time, a day or so to build in where you can go get your Arizona driver's license. You also have to pass a medical exam. Um, that is something we will give you after we've already given you a job offer. A medical exam is, is just like maybe going to take a physical for a, if you ever played a sport and you had to go take a sports physical. It's a little bit like that uh, with a little bit of additional things you have. They hook you up to an EKG. They make you get on a stair stepper, things like that. Nothing too crazy. The uh, next few are the ones where we get most of the people disqualified from, and that's because they're related to drugs and narcotics. So the next one is no marijuana in the last three years and no more than 20 times total. What we mean is, you first of all, you cannot have smoked marijuana at all within the last three years. So if you smoked marijuana a year ago, you have to wait two years until you can apply, Okay. Also, you cannot have smoked it more than 20 times in your life, lifetime. So if you don't know what your number is and you, tell, you call us all the time, we get these questions, hey, I have no idea how many times I did it. We're going to just tell you that you need to make your best educated guess, okay? Um, another one that comes up here a lot is, hey, I'm from Colorado. I'm from California. I'm from wherever um, marijuana is legal where I'm from, so that's what I did. The state of Arizona, unfortunately, does not recognize those. They recognize state law, state requirements here through Arizona Post. So if you do not meet these minimum standards for marijuana use, you're gonna be disqualified. The next one is no dangerous drugs in the last seven years. Dangerous drugs, uh, the most common ones that we normally see are like cocaine, meth, things like that. Um, there are also narcotic drugs that fall into this same category, narcotic drugs being things like heroin. Uh, you cannot you have used them at all in the last seven years. So if you graduated from college and you were super happy to be out of school and you snorted cocaine five years ago, you have to wait two years. So it's seven years of absolutely nothing. And you cannot have tried it any more than five times in your life total. Uh, DUIs also has to be nothing within the three, the last three years. If you've had a DUI before and it's been longer than three years, you are eligible to apply. Um, we have hired people who have had DUIs in their past, so we're not looking for people who are perfect by any means. But multiple DUIs, probably not going to work for you. But if you've had one in the past, 
six, seven years ago, whatever the case may be, um, you are allowed to apply. So that 36 months rule with the DUI, the three years, is that is you have to be completely done with everything. So the DUI, your court case, your um, your intoxilite, your breathalyzer in your car, your suspended license, all those things that come with getting a DUI have to be completely done and finished and it has to be three years, if that makes sense. And the last one um, is no poor pattern of driving. That's more of an individual one we'll look at, but you cannot have multiple tickets, driver's license suspensions, things like that. Those are all things that show, again, patterns of behavior, and those are all things we'll look at. And if you have excessive amounts of those, then you're probably gonna get disqualified. Okay, so now that we've gone over the minimum requirements, we're gonna move on to the next step in the process, and that is the actual overview of the hiring process itself. So for those of you who have already applied for the job, turned in your application, and you have gotten an invitation to the physical fitness test, this part here will not apply to you. Um, it never hurts to go over it again, but this part here is for all of you who are thinking about taking the test, haven't really applied, and don't know where to get started. So this is how it works. So we will have a job announcement come out for police officer recruit position. Um, our main city's webpage is where they will post it. We drive all our traffic to the recruiting webpage, which is uh, www.mpdjobs.com. And every Monday morning, we update our website with any open jobs within the city and the police department, but specifically the police department on our recruiting page. So if you're looking for a job, either police officer recruit, um, even police officer laterals if you're watching this, or you're looking for a job as a civilian within the police department, every Monday morning we update that list. So if you get in the habit of going to our website, there's a jobs tab, you can click on that all the current open positions are usually there on the bottom. So you decide, yes, I wanna apply for this job, what do I need to do? Well, you can go directly to our website and apply right online. We don't do anything with paper. So you can go to uh, www.mpdjobs.com and then go to, um, if you look at the next slide, you'll see, a, you'll see our website there um, there's an apply now button. You can slip, simply click on the apply now button and that'll bring it up and you can start the process right from there. So if you'll see the next page, that is another way. So where I'm giving you a few examples of how easy it is to find this on our webpage. You can, you can see there, it says click here, apply online. That is when you go to the police officer recruit tag. You can click on that and then it says apply online. Or if you go to the City of Mesa website, that's what this one looks like again. You simply type in police officer recruit, hit the apply button. What am I getting at? I'm, it's pretty easy to apply. There's tons of different ways you can find this and it shouldn't be that hard to figure out. Okay? So when you click on the apply button, this screen comes up. You're gonna have to put in a username and a password. So you'll have to create an account basically, and we'll do everything by email. So you'll get notifications by email, you'll get invitations to come out and test by email, all of those sorts of things. So you create an account using your e an email and a password, something you generate of course, and then that'll take you into the system itself. You'll simply confirm that you agree with the terms of service for the application, just like most websites have you do nowadays. And then you'll go to the um, general information screen. It's pretty easy, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have to tab into each box, and if you miss a box, it's not gonna let you move on. And you simply fill out the application. It's gonna ask you general information, things like that, as well as some of those questions that we spoke previous about, about minimum requirements, things like that. It shouldn't take you any longer than 10 or 15 minutes to fill it out. You'll then submit the application. You'll get an email response that says your application was accepted. And what will happen then is it'll go to our city human resources department 
who handles all of our applications. They will run your application through a pre-screening process. And if any of you do not meet some of the requirements, then the process will stop for you at that point. You'll get an email basically saying your application was rejected for whatever the following reason was, and we go on from there. If you fill your application out, you submit it, and it goes through Human Resources Department. They screen it. Everything looks good. We are going to send you an invitation to come out and take the test. So the way our department does it, every department does it a little bit differently. We hold our physical fitness test in the morning, always. So that is the first step in the process, is our physical fitness test. And then we also hold our written examination that same day in the afternoon. So the, the first two steps in the process are completed in one day. Our, our testing schedule is on our website, so we usually have our applications open constantly. We shut it, we shut it down for about one day while we regroup, and then we put it right back out the following day with the testing dates on there. So for those of you who are gonna see this who have already applied and been accepted, your, uh, your schedule will be coming out soon. Um, check your email for that. So the physical fitness test. Um, it is the POPAT test. We used to do um, the Cooper test. So if you don't know what either one of those tests are, if you've never had a physical fitness test or you're unfamiliar with those terms, um, the Cooper test consisted of push-ups, sit-ups, and a mile and a half run. We have gone away from that test now. We no longer do that. So if you have applied for our department before and had to do the Cooper test, we don't do that anymore. Um, we now do the POPAT test. So the POPAT test is of uh, four different things. So it's a 99-yard obstacle course. It is a body drag. Um, you have to drag a 165-pound dummy approximately 32 feet. We then have you jump a six-foot chain-link fence, jump over and then run, and then a six-foot solid fence. And then the last thing we do for the POPAT test is a 500-yard run. So each one of those events is based on time, and every single person has different times, of course. So you run the obstacle course, you get your time, whatever your time is equates to a certain amount of points. And same thing with the body drag, the fence, and the run. So we will do the physical fitness test in the morning. We will have um, our background investigators out there. They're gonna be scoring all of, your, all of your tests. And then you will get that result usually about a week or so after the test. So the next slide um, talks a little bit more in depth about what I had just mentioned. So you have the 99 yard obstacle course. It's several sharp turns. It's some curb height obstacles, things like that. It's supposed to simulate what officers would do on the street a little bit better than running a mile and a half. The body drag, you'll have to lift up the body, uh, excuse me, lift up the dummy. That's not a live person and you have to drag that dummy 32 feet from one area across a line, and then you're timed. Our chain link fence, um, you're gonna get a five yard head start. You run, the obstacle is to get over the fence and then continue beyond the fence and, and run past a line for time. Again, it's 25 yards past the fence. So it's five yards to the fence, up over the fence, and then 25 yard run after. So you're gonna do that with a chain link fence and also a solid fence. So you gotta jump two different walls. And then the last one, like I said, is a 500 yard run. Um, if anybody wants to know how far that is and you're running on the street, if you run at a track, a high school track, anything like that, it's basically one lap around the track with an additional 100 yards. So if you have a way to measure that out, that's how you can practice. In order to pass the POPAT, um, you have to have a minimum passing score. And like I said, your time on each event equates to points. And you have to have a score of 380 points or higher in order to pass the POPAT test.
quick video of just an overview of what the Popat test looks like. Again, you can look online. You can get a lot of information online as well if that's something you're interested in. Or you can simply contact us too and we can do our best to answer any questions for you. So let's keep moving along in the process now. So obviously you have applied for the test online, okay? You got screened, your application looked good. You got invited to take, come out and take the test. You went out, took POPAT. POPAT's gonna be done in the morning. We usually finish up about 10, 10.30 in the morning. We invite you to come back by noon and you're gonna take the written test at noon. So our written test, we get lots of questions about this. Um, it measures general aptitude. I don't know of any other departments that are using this test. So we get a lot of calls of, hey, I passed the test with Phoenix PD. Can you use my score from Phoenix? We can't, we don't use the same test. We don't use the same test as some of the other Valley departments in this area. So you have to come out and take our test. It is a multiple choice exam. It gets administered by our human resources department and um, you have to score 70% or better in order to pass. Uh, when you get to this point or when you get to the application process and you get invited out to take the test, our human resources department will send you a link for a study guide. Uh, we will put that link up on our, our slideshow here. Um, we do not make any money off this thing, so if you want to use it, use it. Um, just know that uh, you can only view it on a computer. So if you buy it, pay the 15 bucks or whatever it is, and then try to get it on your phone, it's not going to work. And then once you use it, I believe you can only use it once. So buyer beware on that. So the multiple choice test, um, it's broken up into three sections. One of them is a math section. One of them is a reading comprehension section. And then we have some stuff um, general stuff on directions, things like that. So one of the things that constantly trips people up is the math portion of the test, believe it or not. It is um, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, those kind of things. So if you, as you can see by the example of here, these are a couple of examples that um, we put up on the board that you could possibly see. So I'll, I'll just briefly go over it. So if an officer worked from 2 o'clock to 12 a.m. and was called to a robbery at 11.30 p.m. and remained there until 2.30 a.m., how long did the officer go over their regular shift? That is some of the type of question you will see. Another one you'll see as far as math, if the following amounts were for items damaged in a crime, what is the total of their values? So you simply add up the total. Another section is reading comprehension. So that's where you read a passage. It's usually a paragraph. You answer questions. Questions are usually true, false questions or multiple choice um, to pick from the answer there. There's some grammar on there. And there's also a little bit of incident report writing. So you'll read a report and then you'll answer some questions related to the report. It's, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on taking police exams online. I personally don't think you need to spend your money on these as it pertains to the test with Mesa PD, but they're out there if you wanna look at them. So as we keep moving along in the process now, so you've, you've gotten accepted obviously, you've taken the physical fitness test and you've taken the uh, written test as well. The next thing in the process is gonna be filling out your background packet. That is different than the initial application that you've already filled out. This is uh, where we have a new program that I spoke about at the very beginning where uh, it is a web-based program. It's called ESOF, and it is a way to gather information and manage your background investigation process with your background investigator. So you will receive an email after you take the multiple choice test. You will receive an email letting you know that you have passed both the written and the physical fitness test. Okay, so you'll get that email. Within that email, you're gonna get a link and an access code. So you'll have to click on the link for the ESOF program, and you'll have to go through a process of registering again by using an email and a password. And once you do that, then you can come back to the application process itself. Um, but you have to click on that link and register within two weeks. 
If you do not do that within two weeks, your code is invalid and you'll have to start the process over again and we probably won't give you another two weeks to get that done. Everything's on a timeline. So you have to get that in as quickly as possible. What are we looking for within the application or the background investigation itself? It's gonna go through a bunch of different details, okay? The more accurate you are in filling this out, the quicker your chances are of getting a one-on-one -on -one interview with a background investigator, which then moves along your file that much quicker. So the next slide will just show you what the ESOF looks like. Um, you will you will put in your email address in there and go from there. Um, the first section is personal information and it's pretty much self-explanatory. It's asking you for your full name, first name, middle, last name. You, you, you type it into the box and you move down to the next box and you answer each question. The good thing about the ESOF program is if you miss something, it's gonna notify you and it's not gonna let you move on until you either fix the box you missed or the, or the information you didn't provide or you have to check something in a box in order to move on. Again, my advice to you is to get that done as quickly as possible, be as detailed as possible. So when you have it all done and, and it's completed, you're gonna submit it electronically. And then they will assign your background packet to a background investigator that works for the department. So the quicker you get it in, the quicker you get it assigned to an investigator, and the quicker you get into an interview and possibly a polygraph test. So once your application comes in, your background investigator is gonna review it, and then they're gonna call you in for a background interview. So with everything going on right now, we are changing some of the ways we do these. We are not doing them in person at this point. Uh, as soon as these bans get lifted, as far as the corona stuff is concerned, we're gonna go back to doing interviews in person. But right now, we are doing everything we can to get these interviews completed either over the phone, FaceTime, uh, we use Microsoft Teams. We have a bunch of different avenues to get these things done. The interview itself is, is gonna be with your investigator and what we're gonna do is just confirm all of the information that you put into your background packet and then make sure that we are all on the same page as far as the information that is contained in the packet. We're gonna cover the main elements of the packet will be your criminal history, your employment history, financial history as well. Um, we will talk about your personal references. Uh, we will also f get a little bit of information about your spouse, significant other, because we will send them some information as well. What we're doing is we're trying to build an overall puzzle of your background and your life and your work history, things like that. Always dress professionally. And even if you're doing an interview virtually, um, I highly recommend that you don't wear a t-shirt with holes in it. Uh, I would not wear a tank top. I would not do anything like that. I would wear conservative attire. Me personally, I would wear a, a shirt and a tie, even though it's online and it's virtual. You're trying to put your best foot forward at all times. So dress professionally. If your interview is scheduled on a certain time, be there on time, don't be late. Uh, my recommendation is always, if it's an in-person interview, I would be there at least 15 minutes early to make sure you are ready to go at the scheduled time. If we're doing things online, then of course, just be ready when your investigator contacts you. We're gonna ask you in this process for a lot of documentation. We'll go over that a little bit more in depth or your background investigator will give you a lot, a list of all the documentation that you need. If you wanna get ahead of the game, um, make sure, go find your birth certificate. We're gonna need an original copy of your birth certificate. We're not gonna keep it, we're just gonna make a copy and give it back to you. We're also gonna to need to see your social security card. If you are in the military or former military, we're gonna need your DD-214. Uh, we're going to need transcripts from any schools you attended, including high school and college. So these are all things you can start gathering now in order to make that process for you faster when you get there. While you're in the interview or speaking with somebody on the phone or, or virtually, um, the biggest thing is to be honest and tell the truth. That is, the, that is one of the things that disqualifies people the most in this process is they simply 
either misrepresent what actually happened to them in, in a certain area of the life or they're too embarrassed to tell the truth to their investigator because they just simply don't want their investigator to know. Um, but it's always better to be honest because if, if your lie or your dishonesty comes out later in the process, you're going to get disqualified for the lying part, not for the actual act itself. Always try okay. to make a good first impression, which I talked about already, and answer all the questions that are asked. Be direct. Be ready to provide details to your investigator when they ask you for more details. And lastly, don't make excuses. If you've done something in your past that is gonna, that you think might possibly hurt you down the road, it's always better to just say, hey, listen, I made a dumb mistake when I was 19. I was drinking a beer, I got caught, I got a ticket. Always better to do that up front. The next uh, slide is some of the documents I kind of went over there. Um, you can look at those at your leisure, but like I said, it's better for you to get these things and start gathering them now, and that'll be a lot less work for your investigator and for you a little bit down the road. Your investigator will let you know how to get those to them. Um, the ESOF program has the ability for you to upload those documents, but our most important thing for you right now is to get your actual um, ESOF packet in. Don't worry about, hey, my transcripts aren't here. I can't send in my, my packet because I'm waiting on those. Send it in electronically. We'll get your documents at a later time. Now you've uh, gotten to the point where you've turned in your background packet. You've had your interview with your background investigator. At some point, things are a little bit different right now with everything going on in the world. But in normally, you would have your interview with your investigator one-on-one -on -one in person. And then right after that, what we would do is we would put you through a written communication skills test. So what that is, is that is a 250-word essay that you have to complete in 40 minutes. We will give you a topic and we will give you some paper and we will just tell you, hey, you have 40 minutes to write this essay on this topic. Um, we are not looking for English majors by any stretch of the imagination. All we're looking for is do you have basic skills? Do you know how to put a paragraph together? Do you know where to put capitalization? Can you put proper grammar, punctuation, spelling? Is it legible? That's another thing. You know, make sure it's legible. We are, we are in the process of moving this test to where you can type it on a computer. So if those of you with good typing skills, you'll be fine. If you are somebody who thinks uh, you need help in this area, we have there is a website, again, it's just something we direct people to. It's called Grammarly.com. You can go on there and it'll give you some skills to go through just to see where you're at. Um, this will be graded by your investigator, just so you know. And we're looking for, again, just somebody who can put thoughts to paper. So this, this job as a police officer, a lot of time is spent writing reports, making sure you have all the information that you've gathered on a scene. And it does you no good to be out on a scene and handle a situation if you can't write the report to describe what happened. So that is what the uh, written communication skills test is. For those of you who are doing your um, interviews online, what we'll do is we'll give this to you probably during the polygraph examination because you have to come in for that. So once you uh, have your background interview, your investigator is then gonna, gonna write a summary report that is gonna get sent to our supervisor. If our supervisor signs off on it and says, yes, this person is ready to move on to the next step in the process, we will then get you scheduled for a polygraph exam. Um, for those of you who don't believe in the polygraph or whatever the case may be, again, not a MESA rule. We follow state rules and our state agency says that everybody will go through a polygraph, okay? Um, the way that'll work is we'll have you come in, you'll sit down with our polygraphers. We have two of them that work for our department. They'll do a half hour interview with you, go over exactly what they're gonna ask you when they hook you up to the machine. And then that way there aren't any questions or you don't go into a blind not knowing exactly what to expect. And then when they hook you up, basically all your questions are gonna be yes and new no answers for the most part. You, once you pass polygraph, you're pretty much at the finish line. Um, your, your investigator, your background investigator will then 
put all of his information together that he or she has completed over those all those steps in the process and they will combine your file and send it to the hiring review board for Mesa PD the hiring review board consists of a hiring commander a hiring lieutenant and the hiring sergeant so the background investigator brings your file to the hiring sergeant says uh, John Smith has completed all the steps in the process here's his file the sergeant reviews it either agrees or disagrees sends it on to the lieutenant onto the commander and then back again once it goes through all of those three people you're gonna get a recommendation either acceptable or unacceptable so if you get a acceptable recommendation then you get placed onto our eligibility list and the way that works is you are on that eligibility eligibility list for up to one year so you have a year in order to get picked to go to one of our police academies so if your file gets done in april of 2020 and you are on the eligibility list then you could possibly be chosen for the july academy class or even the january academy class for the following year as long as you are within that one year time frame, you are eligible to go to any one of those academies. If John Smith makes it onto the eligibility list and we're hiring 40 people for our July Academy, John Smith gets picked as one of those 40. He is gonna get called by his background investigator and they are gonna offer you a conditional offer of employment. So we'll have you come in. You're gonna sign some paperwork saying, yes, I'm accepting the job, this is the pay, this is the starting time. All of that information will be explained to you at that time. And then we will set you up for the last two steps in the process, which are the medical exam and the psychological evaluation. So we call it a conditional offer of employment simply because it's conditional on you passing the medical exam and the psych eval. If you pass both the medical and the psych eval, then you're pretty much done at that point. And then you just move on to the academy and we'll give you the start date and times and things like that. So that is how the process works from beginning to end. Um, and if, again, if you guys have any questions along the way at the end here, I will give you um, an email how to get a hold of me or my boss and we'll be happy to answer any additional questions you have. How to be successful. That's a, th a, a, a reoccurring theme with anybody who's trying to get on. How do I get to the top of the list? How do I make sure I stand out in the crowd from all the other applicants that are out there? The first one is simply follow directions. I don't know how many times we send out information and applicants either don't read the information or don't bother to follow the directions. Same thing goes with the ESOF packets. Um, we give you a set amount of time to get that in. And then the day before they're due, We'll get bombarded with emails about, hey, I didn't, I haven't gotten this done. Can I get an extension? Can we do this? The answer is no, you can't. Unless there's some overriding circumstance on a case-by-case -case basis, that'll be handled by the hiring sergeant. 99% of the time, the answer is going to be no. We've given you an opportunity to get this done. We expect you to do that. So follow the directions. The next one is be detailed, be neat, and complete every box. Some of these will not even allow you to move from one screen to the next. But if there is a box there where they're asking for an explanation on something, make sure you put something in there and explain in detail what it is you're answering. Turn in your paperwork promptly. We talked about this already, gathering all your documents ahead of time. Um, get that application in right away though, and then you can bring your documents to your interview. You can get with your background investigator to make sure they get those right away. But the quicker you get those to your investigator, the easier it is for your investigator to move through your file at that time. Have good personal references. Uh, this is one that trips up a lot of people. They will put uh, references down who then we try to contact and we never hear from them for whatever reason. Make sure if you're gonna apply, we're gonna ask you for three, three good references. Make sure it's somebody you've known for a while, somebody that can vouch for your character. Um, old coaches, teachers, pastors, um, friends of your parents, people like that who have known you for a while and will actually fill the form out and get it back to us. Those are the people that you want. Be flexible with your appointments if you can. Obviously during this corona crisis, that's kind of out the window, but in a normal everyday when we're back to doing business the regular way, 
we oftentimes get people who cancel appointments, um, who cannot make it for whatever reason. So if I, as a background investigator, have a cancellation, I'm going to call one of my other applicants and see if they can take a slot for either an interview, a, a polygraph, a medical exam, whatever the case may be. And if somebody's flexible and can do that, the quicker they will get through the process as well. We already talked about dressing professionally and appropriate. Uh, don't show up uh, in dirty work clothes. If you work outside, take the time to 10 minutes and, and go change your clothes, things like that, and be presentable. And then uh, communicate, cl communicate clearly, sorry, either in email form or by the phone. Make sure you are on the same page as your investigator and you're getting the information they're requesting or you're answering the information that they're asking for. Okay, how can you make yourself a better candidate? There's a lot of different ways you can do that. The minimum requirements we talked about before are exactly that. They're minimum requirements. So if you meet those, you're going to get the same shot as everybody else to get into one of our academy, uh, one of our academy classes. Okay, But if you want to make yourself a better candidate, there are some ways to do that. If you had a law enforcement related job before, whether that be detention, um, you know, working at a jail, there's private prisons, there's things like that, there's probation, there's all kinds of different law enforcement related jobs. Put those things down on your application, of course. Talk about those things in your interview. That shows that you are kind of in this field already, you understand how things work, you know what the process is like. Um, you can take law enforcement related education classes, things like that, criminal justice classes, anything you can do that's going to give you a little bit more of a head start on what this job entails is something you can put down as a resume builder. Um, do you have military experience? That's another one we get a lot. Um, most of our academy classes always have um, veterans in them, people with military experience. You know, they understand chain of command. They understand the paramilitary process that we use, things like that. So if you have military experience, that is something you definitely want to bring out and showcase that during the course of your application process. If you do volunteer work, that's another one we like. Um, that just shows you're out in the community working on behalf of others with no necessarily pay attached to it, you know, doing things to help better the community. Those are all things we like to look at. Consistent job history is another big one. Uh, if you're that type of person who is jumping from job to job to job to job to job, that shows patterns of behavior. We want to know why you're doing that. If you're jumping from a job for better pay or better benefits, we understand that. But if you have 10 jobs in the last 14 months and every one of those jobs you left because you didn't like your manager or you didn't like the hours that you worked, or you didn't get along with your coworkers. Those are things that raise red flags for us. So have a consistent job history. Get recommendations. There's nothing wrong. We're gonna ask you for personal references. There's nothing wrong with attaching recommendations from people you feel will uh, give the department a side of you that maybe we haven't seen yet. Um, teachers, Boy Scout troop leaders, Girl Scout troop leaders, um, gymnastics coaches, whatever the case may be, whatever your, um, whatever the people you've come across in your life that you feel will give you a good recommendation, don't hesitate to include that stuff with your packet. We will look at it. Be detailed oriented. Have uh, be organized. Another one is organization skills. Police officers have to be detailed and organized on the street. The better organized you are, the easier this job is. So if you're somebody who pays attention to details and is constantly has their stuff together and is organized, you're gonna do well in this field. We look for problem solvers, people with good communication skills. Um, believe it or not, a lot of the best police officers we come across have been in service industries, waiting tables, um, working with the public on an everyday basis. Anytime you're making contact with people and having to speak with people and problem solve and do things like that, we look at that because that is what we do on a daily basis as well. Uh, minimal criminal history. Of course, we're not going to hire perfect people. Like I said at the beginning of this, um, we do hire people that have had some hiccups in their past and 
they've overcome those. They've changed the way they live their life. They've did some stuff as a younger person and now they're back on track. Or they even did some stuff three or four years ago. As long as you can show that you've changed your behavior and you're moving more in a positive direction, that's what we're gonna look at. Are you committed to the job? I know right now times are tough. There's a lot of people who are out of work. Um, we don't want people who just need a job necessarily, okay? We will not fill our academy classes with 40 people if 40 people aren't qualified. We'll go with 35 or 36, whatever the case may be. We want to see commitment. This is a 25-year-plus career, and we're hoping that you look at it the same way. You can do ride-alongs, uh, research in law enforcement. Most ride-along programs have probably been curtailed right now with everything going on, but you know, you can check into that and maybe try to get that in when you can. Or if you've already done that, bring that stuff out as well. Basic Recruit Training Academy is 22 weeks long. So you will go to the academy every day. It's a normal job. It's not a military style academy where you live there at night. You'll go Monday through Friday, eight hours a day, and then you are off on the weekend. Depending on what time of the year you Start the academy depends on what time you have to show up. But with Arizona and it being hot, you're going to show up pretty early no matter what time of the year it is. After you complete your 22 weeks in the academy and you graduate, you will then move on to the field training program. And that is 16 weeks long. The field training program is when you take everything you've learned at the academy out onto the street. You're going to ride with a partner who is your field training officer and then you're gonna to have to meet some expected goals throughout that 16 weeks in order to eventually complete your training program on the street, graduate, and become a solo ready officer. Going into the academy, you have to understand and you have to be ready for the things that you're gonna to have to tackle while you're there. Being early is always a good thing. They're gonna give you specific uh, details about when you can and can't be at the academy grounds. Just follow those rules, but never be late. Again, time management, we talked about that. In the academy specifically, time management is gonna be a huge thing. You're gonna to have tons of tasks to complete outside of the academy hours. You're gonna to have to organize your time and get those tasks done for the following day. You can do study sessions at night and on the weekends. That is stuff you will do as a group. Um, when you get to that point in the academy, that stuff will be, uh, you can do that together as part of your class. But always having people to bounce ideas off, to study with, um, leads to success in the academy. Get your family affairs in order. What I mean by that is, is if you're planning on getting married during the academy, uh, just explain to your soon-to-be spouse that, you know, taking a, taking a honeymoon in the middle, middle of the academy is not going to happen. Okay, the academy is very strict as far as number of hours you need to complete. Um, you cannot just be gone for a week in the academy and come back and expect to pick up where you left off. It doesn't work that way. So just make sure your family's aware that for the next six to eight months throughout the training that you're going to go through with Mesa PD, that you're going to be pretty busy and just get all those things in order. Same thing with your financial affairs. Um, we just give advice to not make any huge financial decisions while all of this is going on. Um, buying a house is stressful enough. Moving is stressful enough. When you're not in the academy, you tack all of that, inf all that stress onto the academy itself. And we've seen in the past that it just does not work well. So try to get all that stuff squared away ahead of time or wait until you're out of training and off the training program to do some of those big things. Upfront costs in the academy, we'll tell you now so you can start saving your pennies. You're gonna have to outlay some money upfront the first four weeks of the academy or so um, to buy gear, things like that. You're gonna get some of that, in, some of that money back with your uniform allowance, but some of it is gonna, you're just gonna have to pay for upfront. So we don't want anybody to go in thinking, you know, I have $40 in the bank. I need to go out and buy $1,000 worth of gear. That's, that's going to be a problem. So just know that ahead of time, you're going to have to outlay some money. Um, as far as physical preparation in the academy, 
everybody should be working out. That's a given. Um, once you take the initial test with us, the POPAT test, that doesn't mean you, you're technically in, you pass the physical fitness test, so you're good. You should be working out all the time, getting ready for the academy, okay? Um, running, obviously the academy, they do some running there. Make sure you're, you're on some sort of a program. And my advice would be to get out of the gym, don't run on a treadmill, run outside. We don't run on a treadmill in the academy. You gotta get used to running outside in the elements, in the heat, those kind of things. So do it now. You get your body gets acclimated to it, and then it prevents injuries down the road. If you're big, uh, if you're into weightlifting, things like that, um, being strong is great. We aren't going to have many times in the academy where you're going to be in the gym bench pressing as much as you possibly can. Okay, so we recommend you do body weight exercises, things like push ups, sit ups, pull ups, um, squatting. Uh, with dumbbells, things like that, high intensity interval training. Those are all things that you can do to be well-rounded physically that will help you in the academy. Monitor obviously what type of, of food you're eating and, and things like that. Get on some type of a program where you're putting healthy, nutritious stuff into your body as fuel because you're gonna be burning a lot of calories while you're in the academy. The last thing I'll mention is, is just to never give up. That is one of the mottos that we have in the academy. Do your best and never give up. You might not be the fastest person, you might not be the strongest person, but as long as you focus on what you're doing individually, never give up, it will lead to success down the road. That ends the seminar. I hope that answered some of the questions for you about the process itself, um, gave you some ideas on how to get ahead, how to be successful in the process. Our last slide again, like I said, we drive all of our traffic to our website. You can see it there on the slide, mpdjobs.com. The City of Mesa website is also there as well. And our email address, if you need to speak with myself uh, or my sergeant in recruiting, you can simply go to join MPD, so that's J-O-I-N-M-P-D at mesaaz.gov. That will go to our recruiting email and one of us will answer it. We usually get to it within a day or so, okay? Um, if you have any other questions, anything I didn't cover, feel free to reach out to us and we are available. Thank you for your time and good luck in the process.